This is BYU Sports Nation, brought to you by the BYU Store, simulcast on BYU-TV and BYU-Radio. Now, from Studio B, here's Spencer Linton and Jerem Jordan. BYU Sports Nation is a go, a special all-decade edition of the show, your day-to-day BYU Sports play-by-play, presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Welcome! Wherever and however you're connected, great to have you with us. I am Spencer Linton, teamed up with the guy who, frankly, makes my BYU Sports Nation all-decade host team, Jerem Jordan. Thank you. Let's see. Let's name some of the other hosts. Uh, Jason Shepard, Johnny Linehan, Kevin Nixon. Tanner Mangum. Kyle Chilton. Johnny Duff, Linehan, Duff, you said already? Yes. Duff Tittle. Uh, David Nixon. One time. Blaine Fowler. Dave McCann. Yeah, okay, that's good that I'm in. That's a, Kate Hansen. Kate Hansen. Warren, McLean. That's right. There have been some. Ben uh, Bagley some has great ones. co-hosted. That's r- the producer even hosted. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, the, that's the a list notab- is up over ten. That's a notable list. I'm uh, happy just to be on the list. You're in, you're in my five. Thank you, Charles. You're, you're in my five. What was that like eight years ago? <laughs> <laughs> so long ago. Today we look at the best of the past decade in BYU football as we present officially our BYU Sports Nation. All decade football team. Now everyone knows that we've uh, got an extensive research team here. Oh, just a crack staff of twenty plus that have mm-hmm. scoured box scores and summaries and recaps. Something like that. Uh, yes, twenty plus, maybe minus eighteen or something. But um, some very official closed door balloting happened to discover the top players between twenty ten and twenty nineteen. Those ten years, including the one that. Uh, has happened recently. Yes. We have scoured, and that's one of my favorite scoured. verbs. We have scoured the rosters over the last 10 years and determined this list based on the following criteria. One, accomplishments at BYU. Two, iconic BYU moments. And three, careers after BYU. So, so that, that, that matters. All those things considered. That matters. Okay? All right. Jeremy, let's go ahead and start with the spotlight position in the game of football and Clearly, the spotlight at BYU, our all-decade QB1 is, not surprisingly, Taysom Hill. Okay, five seasons at BYU. It felt like two and a half. Uh, Only one was full, 13 games. It was 2013. In that season, he had the fifth most yards in total offense in BYU history. Against seven Power 5 teams, by the way, as a sophomore. He played in 37 games, should have been 52-plus. 23-10 and 10 as a starter, 21-9 and nine in games he finished as a starter. And there wasn't a single game where he started and finished that BYU wasn't within two scores in. Never got blown out. The that's Taysom a, factor. That's a big deal to me. Almost 7,000 yards passing, passing 28-15 rushing. That's fifth at BYU. By the way, 470 yards taken away for sacks. He would have been almost the all-time leading rusher. Seriously. 9,744 total yards, fourth in BYU history in total offense. That's behind Detmer Hollenbeck and ahead of McMahon, Young, and Bosco. I rest my case. There was only one name that even came close to popping into that Heisman Trophy conversation at any moment over the last decade, and it was Taysom Hill, and well-deserved. He played the most power five teams of any BYU quarterback, 16 games, Won eight of those, eight and eight, that's, as a starter against Power Five competition. That's a better percentage than BYU won under Lavelle, won under Bronco Mendenhall, and won under, under Kalani Satake. He was the best quarterback BYU's ha- had in the last decade. Now, you, if you were discussing him against John Beck and Max Hall and Jim McMahon and Steve Young and Titan, now it gets interesting. To me, the greatest athlete who played quarterback, even over Steve Young. Taysom Hill. Even over Steve Young. I believe that. Ty Detmer. Played 13 games against Power 5 competition. He won the Heisman Trophy. He was the best quarterback in the country. No doubt about it. Three wins, nine losses, one tie. That's tough. It's tough. This guy was supposed to go to Stanford, which is like the arch nemesis of BYU in recruiting and in the postseason right now. Utah is definitely the rival, but Stanford recently has given BYU so much trouble. This guy was going to go there. BYU is lucky that they got him, and he is an all-timer at BYU. Let's talk about the iconic moments for Taysom Hill. Yes. 
The game against Houston, over 400 yards passing, over 100 yards rushing. That comes to mind, but it's not first for okay. me. The so hurdle I, is the moment sure, sure. for him, right? Iconic moments. And I'm just going chronologically. So I start back, tw- even going back to 2012. Chronologically? This is an hour okay. show. Even going back to 2012, when he came in to replace Riley Nelson at Boise State, puts BYU in position to win that game and ultimately a 7-6 to six loss, but then wins his first two starts. One of them is one of the best wins based on where the opponents finish uh, at the end of the season. Utah State, that they team finished, finished 16th. 16th. BYU and Taysom Hill in his second start beat that team. And his third start is Virginia, and BYU loses. But then he goes on a nice little run here, including Texas at home, 259 yards rushing, which was just unbelievable. It was bonkers. The white dude in the knee brace, right? They're still seeing ghosts in Austin. Yes, t- yeah, exactly. Texas, everybody in Texas knows who Taysom Hill is well before he was doing things for the New Orleans Saints. Yeah, just an all-timer, iconic. 2016, he wasn't the same kind of player. I'm not sure if it was the offense, if it was him hesitant with the knee or whatnot, but by pro day of 2017, when he goes undrafted into the NFL, and now he's doing just amazing things with the Saints, he was incredible in pro day. He ran a 4-4, and he's like 220. <laughs> like, what, are you kidding me? Um, It's been fun to see him at the next level excel because we knew he was an all-time athlete, an all-time player. It was just, it was fun to watch him. But what would have happened in 2014? And I've said this a bunch on the show. 2014, BYU's 4-0. They're ranked 19th. They're on the radar. Taysom Hill's getting some dark horse Heisman kind of conversation. That season was just starting. BYU only played three power fives, and they had already defeated two. They had Cal at the end of the schedule, who wasn't that good, ended up 5-7. and BYU is going to win 11 or 12 games in the regular season. And validate independence. Yes. And, and BYU didn't play Utah. Maybe that's why, right? Uh, BYU struggled against the Utes. But I would have loved to see that. And see Taysom Hill with a full, flourishing career. We're now seeing it in the NFL. And I think a lot of us on the BYU side are thinking, this is cathartic for what we didn't see at BYU because he only played in 37 games. And it wasn't 13 a year for four years. He played on a broken foot against Nebraska. For the he whole third quarter. He played on a broken foot for an entire quarter. Oh, my gosh. He is Captain America. He is <laughs> Thor. He is Taysom Hill. And he is our all-decade QB1. Yes. Now about the guys that catch the ball. Let's talk about the wide receivers. I mean, uh, you look at the guys that we have here. Cody Hoffman, <laughs> Mitch Matthews, and Jordan Leslie. Yes, what, please. What a group. Yes, please. Okay, let's start with Mitch Matthews. You know how I feel about Mitch Matthews. I think he's the last great, great receiver that has played at BYU. Amen. We're still waiting for another talent like that. I don't know that we'll ever have a guy of his size do what he did. I think he's unique in that regard. Has BYU ever had a 6'6 guy that went and caught the fade like that? I don't think so. I think he's the best at that in BYU history. He was Taysom's favorite receiver, especially against Utah State. Good grief. Mitch Matthews had clearly iconic moments. How about the Hail Mary catch at Nebraska in the same game that Taysom Hill had to leave with a broken foot? Down to the goal line! I can hear the call. Great call by Sean McDonough. So good. Yeah. Mitch Matthews was so good. Top 15 in catches, yards, and touchdowns at BYU. Fantastic. Fifth in BYU history in 20, uh, with 24 touchdowns. Uh, 14th in yards, 12th in catches. His, uh, his final two games against Utah State, by the way. Listen to these mm-hmm. numbers. 14 mm-hmm. catches, 275 yards, three touchdowns. Yep. Just dominated the Aggies. 20 touchdowns in the final two years. He became a very, very good receiver. I'm not going to use that word. But a Eat. very, a very, very good receiver. I think in, in the uh, pantheon of BYU receivers... You could argue that he's one of the elite receivers. I, I, what my argument with you with this was nationally. I don't think people nationally took it, and we're not going to have that debate now. But <laughs> Mitch Matthews was so good. Cody Hoffman, uh, so good. I think Cody Hoffman's the second best receiver that BYU's ever had. All time leading I think receiver. Austin Collie's the goat. Austin uh, Cody passed Austin's numbers because he had an extra year. If Austin plays four years, no one touches these numbers for yes. a while. Um, the all time leader in catches, yards, and TDs. Two hundred sixty. 36, 12, and 30. He had seven 100-yard uh, receiving games against Power 5 teams. Seven. His four games against Utah, 27 catches, 388 yards, and a touchdown. He had two 100-yard games against Utah. Cody Hoppin was really stinking good. Yes, and he had some of those unforgettable catches. He had a number two play on SportsCenter's Top 10 against Georgia Tech when he mosses that dude. I mean, just an unbelievable catch Okay, that he comes down with. Then the one-hander against Hawaii from Riley Nelson. So good. Yeah, Cody Hoppin made some incredible catches. 
Of course, New Mexico State was a terrible team, but he had a huge day against New Mexico State. And then we go to Jordan Leslie. He only played one season at BYU. He makes this list, though. But he made his mark. He was an overnight fan favorite. Yes, and we had a long discussion about whether Mitchell Juergens would be on this list over Jordan Leslie or not. We ultimately went with Jordan Leslie. Mitchell, don't hate. Uh, Jordan Leslie, the one year, but it was a good year, 2014. 55 catches, 779 yards, six touchdowns on a sprained ankle. Had four for 135 against Utah State. And then against Cal, Jared Goff didn't go to a bowl game that year, his sophomore year, I believe. Because five, of Jordan Leslie. Five for 155. He was good, made an immediate impact, transferred from UTEP. BYU needed him. He added to a good receiving core already. BYU had lost Cody Hoffman. Jordan Leslie occupied that space with Mitch Matthews on that team. It might have only been one game, but Jordan Leslie got himself into a regular season NFL game and produced one of the catches of the year in the NFL. Yeah. So we did, and he's a guy that at least got into a game, yep. right? Um, Mitch Matthews uh, was on some practice squads and whatnot, almost got into a game a couple times. Cody Hoffman, I don't think, got into a game either. So BYU has struggled at this position to get guys in the NFL, but these three were awesome at BYU. If and I had to put somebody in the slot of those three, it probably would be Jordan Leslie just based on size because you have Cody Hoffman and Mitch Matthews on the outside. But yeah, Mitchell Jurgens is an interesting conversation there if you want to go the New England Patriots route or the Indianapolis Colts route with right. Peyton Manning when they're throwing to guys like Brandon Stokely and Julian, Julian Edelman. Edelman. Right. Yeah, Danny Amendola. Like mm-hmm. Mitchell Jurgens would be that guy for BYU. Yeah, a classic token short Y guy. Come on. <laughs> Come on. We can do better. There is only one name on our all-decade list at the – Running back position, Jeremy. No, it's not guess, Taysom Hill. Guess who it is? We could have done Taysom for both. It could have been Taysom Hill. It is not surprisingly the J Swag Daddy, Jamal Williams. He's unquestionably one of a kind. He's all time leading rusher at BYU, had over 3,900 yards, 3,901 yep. to be exact, and ran for a record 286 yards in a 55 53 win against Toledo, who had Kareem Hunt, another mm-hmm. NFL running back, on their team. The Swag Daddy takes our number one and only running back spot. Most carries in BYU history as well. Third most touchdowns. 15 100-yard games. He was good. And he brought so much personality to the position as well. Very hard runner. As a young guy, kind of got brought up with Taysom Hill because Michael Lisa broke his arm in the Hawaii game or uh, early in that season. Jamal Williams played with such great emotion, part of some really big wins. At Michigan State was a huge win. Spartans don't end up being that good that year, but Jamal ends up being a guy that helped his stock into the NFL. He didn't have to come back, by the way. So Jamal uh, dips out of school in August of 2015, does not play that season. He could have transferred, been a grad transfer potentially, or just left BYU. Chose to come back, finish what he started like Kylo Ren, and then he had a tremendous senior season, and now he's thriving in the NFL with the Packers. He just played with such ferocity. He never lost yards, and he never fumbled the ball. I mean, what more can you want from your yeah. star running back? You don't lose yards, you don't fumble the ball, and you put together 15 100-yard games. You're the all-time leading rusher, and he was a huge part of some of the biggest BYU wins over the last 10 years. There's a, there's a reason that without Taysom Hill and Jamal Williams, BYU's not been the same team. In fact, they've been a sub-500 team since those two left. Yes, they went... BYU, they went nine and four because of Taysom Hill and Jamal Williams. I think they're probably seven and six without them, right? And that's kind of what we've seen the last couple of years with BYU football is they haven't been able to get to that nine win plateau. It's nice when you have an NFL battery, and they did with Tijon Chroma, by the way, who was injured uh, and, and missed uh, a bunch of time, you know, last season and some of this season. Perhaps he gets a shot in the league at the, the next level uh, with the Chiefs or whatnot. When you have the quarterback and the running back in the center that all have NFL capability, two of the three for sure, now that's special. What was Jamal's iconic moment at BYU? Does he have a moment? I know the game is Toledo, clearly, but does he have a moment? Mm. Maybe, maybe uh, well, there were a bunch. I mean, Texas, as a sophomore, he had 182. Wyoming putting his stamp on like, things as like, the forever poinsettia champs. Just, yes, the yes, stiff arm. The stiff arm on a guy. I, I think his moment was his personality. It was his oh. dancing. It was playing catch with the fans. It was his interactions with us. Uh, he called us uh, middle-aged vanilla men, uh, <laughs> which is completely accurate. Um, <laughs> Yeah, those were the moments for me. Those were the moments for me. <laughs> hey, we've got another pass catcher to talk about. Okay, another position uh, that stood out over a long period of time with BYU's tight end position. Um, but the story's not over for this guy. The best tight end of the decade, in our opinion, we give one guy. It's Matt Bushman. And it, 
It's not close, Jerem. Over this decade, there haven't been a ton of tight ends that produced for BYU until Matt Bushman emerged in 2017. And he was a freshman All-American on a 4-9 and nine team. Like the bright spot? That's Fred, really hard to Fred do. Fred Warner on defense and Matt Bushman on offense? Matt Bushman has been the leading receiver in all three of his seasons at BYU. We'll see how things turn out uh, in 2019 or if he plays through 2020. He's got an opportunity because he is so good if he wants to probably go to the NFL. I don't know that he'll be that high of a draft pick if that's his choice, and I hope he comes back because he can uh, continue to stockpile uh, some attributes and improvement that would lead to him being a higher draft pick. Same with Carvis Tonga, by the way. More on that later. He's been the best tight end in this decade, no doubt. And you look at the numbers, 1,600 yards uh, for a tight end. He passed Chad Lewis from 7th to 6th. Um, that's big time. Nine touchdowns. Certainly can get better, but he's been a bright spot on, on an otherwise struggling offense the last several years. As BYU's tried to get back to what it's been. Um, he's not top five or top ten all-time tight end at BYU, in my opinion. He could climb into the top ten if he stays for a senior year and has a really nice season. He's got to pad those numbers a little bit more. Yes, and the tight end position, I mean, it goes quarterback than tight end in terms of the great positions at BYU. Even more than, say, linebacker, where BYU's produced a bunch of guys over the years. Tight end has been unbelievable here. Yeah, the last time BYU had an elite tight end, it was 2009. Dennis Pitta. That guy, yeah. What's his name again? What was his name again? (laughs) Stop it. Matt Bushman (laughs) is the next elite tight end at BYU. Oh, my goodness. Andrew George did have an iconic moment, that's for sure. I think we thought that Moroni Laulu Pujitao would probably compete more in this. Um, It's been solid this year, but... Hasn't been targeted a ton. Just glad he stayed healthy. At least he's been able to play. That's great. But I, I wanted more out of him. I thought we, we talked about the Atula Mealy, uh, Lewis, and George, and that other guy it's so so much uh, during the summer. But yeah. Now, if Matt Bushman is the leading receiver for three consecutive years, then he's got to be in the top ten all time tight ends, right? At BYU. No. The no. Offenses, no. No. It, the offenses uh, have not been that good. It's not like he put up 700 yards in, in any of these. It was like in the 500s. All right. Yeah. Okay. A debate for another day. Yeah. Finally, on the offensive side of the ball, let's look at the big beauties up front. I don't know why we call them. Why do we always call them the big uglies? I think, I, think I would never call them that because the big, they would beat me the, up. The big beauties. The guys who really go to work and uh, often aren't recognized. Yes, the offensive line. Who are the five guys that protect the quarterback, that open up holes for the running backs, and make the receivers look good because they're giving the quarterback time to get the ball out? Jerem, we're going with the following five. T. John Caroma started all four years. DeAndre Wesley, Matt Reynolds, Braden Hanson, another four-year starter, and Riker Matthews. This is a quality group, and uh, we almost have it where it's you know center, two guards, and two tackles, although I think uh, Braden Hanson uh, is, was – was a tackle. We have like four tackles in the center, I think. We could put Matt Reynolds on the inside if we wanted. Riker Matthews still in the CFL. Braden Hansen really good at BYU. Matt Reynolds, cup of post him in the NFL. Um, he was going to be a guy that played, uh, was going to be a first or second rounder. Decided to stay. Kind of hurt his stock a little bit, but he was tremendous here. DeAndre Wesley's played in a couple of games in the NFL. Three officially. Hopefully he can play in some more, but he's at least been on some practice squads. And as I mentioned, TJ Karoma has been injured. Brady Christensen is a guy that by the end of his career would have cracked this, be on list, this list, in my opinion. Jeff Grimes has spoken very highly of him. NFL scouts say that he pops when they go to practice. In fact, he may be BYU's best NFL prospect at the moment. That's ahead of Kairos Tonga, and ahead of Matt Bushman. Wow. Believe it. The next great challenge for BYU is to start producing the NFL offensive linemen that BYU was so accustomed to putting out in the 80s and the 90s and even into the early 2000s. It was just a regular thing. BYU put offensive linemen into the NFL. That matters. And at the heart of football, it's not the pass and the catch or the pass and the handoff or whatever. The heart of football is me making a block on you so that a guy can make a play behind us or in front of us, right? Um, that's the heart of football is blocking and tackling. And if BYU can get more of those NFL guys, hey, they can compete more in these loaded front heavy schedules with Power 5 teams. The trenches are where you win and lose those games. It's not at the skills yeah. positions. You, you work from the center out. Where's the next John Tate? Where's the next Reynolds brother? I mean, they had a few that cracked into the NFL. Who's the next guy to get into the NFL and stay put 
for a BYU offensive lineman group. Yes. Anyway, that is our all-decade offensive lineup for BYU football. What a team. I mean, you look at it from wire to wire. Uh, Taysom Hill with Cody Hoffman, Mitch Matthews, and Jordan Leslie. He actually (laughs) did throw those guys with Jamal Williams. Um, Imagine Taysom Hill throwing to Matt Bushman. Imagine Taysom Hill protected by Karoma, Wesley, Reynolds, Hanson, and Matthews. I mean, that would be awesome. That would be uh, yes. awesome. Opening up some running lanes for Taysom Hill that's and a, Jamal Williams. That's a 10-win team. That's an 11-win team, baby. In the Mountain West. That's of, an independence-validating in the... team right there. That would have been good. Oh, but it man. depends on who is on the defense, right? Um, and coming up, does Blaine Fowler agree with our all-decade team? What does he know? <laughs> okay, let's be honest. He, he, he knows a lot of stuff. <laughs> up next, the all-decade defensive team. Makes us realize that we had some uh, serious ballers on the other side of the coin as well. This is BYU Sports Nation. You're on the all-defensive decade, too. Woo! BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, the official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. If you want to listen to BYU Sports Nation, it's on demand on iTunes. Tune in or Google Play and enjoy on demand and subscribe, rate, and review. Great to have you with us on BYU Sports Nation for this special hanging out in Studio B. Your day-to-day BYU Sports play-by-play continues. Spencer Linton and Jerem Jordan here with our all-BYU football all-decade team. So there were two alls there. That's from the Department of Redundancy Department. Yes, exactly. The all-BYU football all-decade team. We cool with that? It's been a good decade. <laughs> we revealed the entire offensive side just a few minutes ago. Now we'll go position group by position group on the defensive side of the ball, and that begins up front with three defensive linemen. Yes, the all-decade team is running a 3-4 defense. We want more linebackers. Of those three defensive linemen, we feature a surprise, a giant, and what we think will be the next Cougar heading to the NFL in that position. They are in that order. Ziggy Ansah, Bronson Kafusi. And Kairos Tonga. Okay, let's talk about Ezekiel Ziggyansa. Obviously, the great story. Did you know he didn't play football until he got to BYU? I'm just kidding. We he took didn't know him. how to put on his shoulder pads? He was awesome, right? But he wasn't awesome until his senior year. In fact, uh, the first two years, he had seven tackles. That's it. None in the backfield. All of a sudden, his senior year, he has 62 tackles, which is a lot for a defensive lineman. 13 tackles for loss, four and a half sacks, a pick, and a forced fumble. Amazingly, he had nine pass breakups. Nine is a massive number for a defensive lineman. Fifth pick in the NFL draft. That ties the highest ever with Jim McMahon. His senior, he was so good. And this picture we have right here against Georgia Tech, that was kind of the breakout um, game for Ziggy where we thought, whoa, this guy is a hammer on the defensive line. He was just the, the guy from Ghana who had never played. And then he became, I don't know, this viable defensive lineman that is still in the NFL with my Seahawks. Ziggy Ansa is, yeah, need, and there needs seriously needs to be a movie made about him. Like there oh, needs it's to way be, better than Million Dollar Arm. There needs to be a full scale, hundreds of millions of dollars Hollywood production on the story of how Ziggy Ansa made it to where he is in the NFL. Yeah, yeah, it, I mean, incredible stuff. And it took Paging Ethan, Disney. It took Ethan Manu Maliuna getting injured for Ziggy Ansa to come in. And I knew Ziggy before he played uh, on the football team because he was a guy that would play pickup basketball in the Richards building, and he would always dunk, and I just didn't want to guard him. I played him in an intramural game. Who wants to guard time, that guy? Threw down hard. I was just like, I'm getting out of this poster, man. Yeah, he, he no, was awesome. No, nobody, Such a nice guy, good dude. Nobody wants to guard that guy. And when I went to a Seahawks game, I saw several Ansa jerseys. Like People like him which is pretty cool. Yeah, well, it's fun because Bronson Kafusi is also in the NFL playing with the New York Jets. And we think Kairos Tonga has the capability of becoming one of those staples up front in the NFL for a very long time, a la Helodinara. And uh, some of the other defensive linemen that BYU, or sorry, that Kalani Steiger recruited to Utah. Like that BYU wanted. Yes, that BYU <laughs> wanted and did not get. I think Kairos got a lot of work to get to that level, but I think he could get to the NFL. Um, Kairos, BYU's best nose tackle in a while. BYU's had some good ones, some solid guys that you don't notice because the defense is not built for them to be – uh, the ones getting sacks and getting yeah. in the backfield, right? The ends, yes. But um, Elias Tuiaki thinks that he, he can be a guy in the NFL. He said that early on, and we were like, whoa. Yeah. As a freshman, what? Um, and uh, we're excited to uh, have seen Kairos Tony the last couple of years. We'll see what the future holds. We were all excited about Travis Tuiloma at nose tackle. Did mm-hmm. a great job, right? Kairos Tonga is a better version of Travis Tuiloma. 
Uh, no offense to Travis. I like Travis, but uh, yeah, yeah, way yeah. better. Bronson Kafusi, by the numbers, is a top five defensive line in BYU history. Let me give them to you. Uh, 44 tackles for loss. That's third at BYU. Sorry, David Nixon. You had half tackle for loss less. Uh, 26 and a half sacks is fourth at BYU. 17 okay. quarterback hurries. 15 pass breakups is incredible. Obviously, a longer, taller guy that started playing basketball and football. Finally just migrated to uh, football, and he was incredible. Two interceptions, too, from the defensive line. Played some linebacker as a senior. Yeah, and he started to catch the attention more of his New York Jets coaches, and he did so in the preseason. Like He had, he had a disruptive NFL preseason, did some good things, earned his way onto uh, the squad there, and he's seen some time. So I, I'm, I'm happy to see him after he struggled with some injuries with the yeah. Baltimore Ravens. I am disappointed in Bronson in a major way, though. Just, just, he cut his hair. Oh, he, had this, he, he had this, the locks. He had these amazing, luscious locks, okay. and he cut them, and I don't know why. <laughs> that's the, the, only, that's negative. the, only, that's the only negative. the only negative. You and I knew Bronson back in the day calling high school games, Pro Bowl and Timfew, when he was just this young buck at Timfew. In fact, there was this full-court shot, basketball shot, against Timfew where he watches it as a freshman, and it goes in, and I was like, oh, yeah, that's Bronson. He's a 14-year-old kid with braces on his teeth. <laughs> Surrender Cobra. <laughs> 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 Love the Cafusis. Not bad on the D-line, right? Not bad. So we're go- going with a 3-4 because we want more linebackers because guess what? BYU, the last decade, has produced some really, really good linebackers. Mm-hmm. I would dare say top 20 in the country, right? Um, BYU's had this amazing run, and we give to you these four. Fred Warner. Kyle Van Noy, Sione Takitaki, and Harvey Longy. This is, this is uh, quite a group. Uh, yeah, clearly. Uh, we joke about BYU being linebacker you. Jerem, I think that they have a case, at least to be in the conversation over the last decade, based on what these guys have done and are currently doing in the NFL. The best linebacker on the New England Patriots, Super Bowl defending champion team is Kyle Van Noy. He's the most disruptive player on the front seven. Fred Warner, we think, is going to make the Pro Bowl for the San Francisco 49ers in year number two. Crushing it. Those two dudes are balling out. We haven't seen a ton from Sione with the Cleveland Browns, but once he got back to his usual position at BYU, things got much better. Yeah, and he's with the Browns. That's the main issue. (laughs) When he was drafted by the Browns, I was like, oh, no. And I wonder what Harvey Longy would have done if he hadn't had to move positions at BYU as well. But both of, all of these guys are NFL guys. Yes, and the best of those. Three stuff. of them high-level draft picks. Yes, Fred Warner has been crushing it in, in year two in the NFL. It's been awesome. Uh, Kyle Van Noy, once he left Detroit, things took off for him. And at BYU, he had 62 tackles for loss. That is the most in BYU history. 25 sacks, seven picks, and he had the greatest quarterback, of any individual defense player in the history of BYU. Greatest in a performance, game. yeah. In the fourth quarter specifically, one pick six, one sack strip, force fumble, fumble recovery touchdown. That's all in one play. He won th- the game by himself. Things. And a blocked punt! He won the game by himself. Oh my gosh. He dominated. Like, if I played my six-year-old in basketball, I would not dominate her at a higher level than Kyle Van Noy <laughs> dominated the Aztecs in the fourth quarter. It was unbelievable. <laughs> Second round pick to the Lions. We were on the set recording an interview with Steve Young the day that Kyle Van Noy was traded to the Patriots, and we informed Steve yeah. that this happened, and he said, You just won a Super Bowl, Kyle, Kyle Van Noy. Congratulations. Just Super Bowl. He just won a Super Bowl. <laughs> and they did that year, and then they went the next year and lost to the Eagles, and then they went the next year, last year, and won it. So he's won two out of three. I mean, just... Jerem, think about this. Think about the linebackers that didn't make this list. NFL guys that didn't make our all-decade team. This was the hardest group to figure out. Alani Fua, Wani Unga, Spencer Hadley. All of those guys did not make the team, and all three of them played in the NFL. Yes, this is... For multiple games. BYU can recruit this position and get it to the next level in the NFL specifically, better than any other position. The hardest position is in the secondary, specifically cornerback for BYU. That's the hardest position. Yet, a few have made it. Pretty impressive. And they have, they have overcome. So linebacker, you pretty awesome. I mean, how many schools in the past five years have put eight linebackers into the NFL? We're talking about like a five- to six-year span, eight yeah. guys playing in the NFL. I don't know. I bet it's 10 to 20. But that's not a ton, right? Like what BYU's, BYU's done BYU's up pretty, there. Yeah. For sure. Been pretty impressive. Okay, now to the cornerback position. We have another current National Football League representative in Michael Davis, who is starting for the Los Angeles Chargers of San Diego. And on the other side, 
a guy who we think is going to make his way onto at least a practice squad, maybe a roster in the NFL, Diane Gawoliku. Yes, Michael Davis at BYU did not impress that much. He's been way better in the NFL than at BYU. In fact, Michael Davis was benched for Diane Gawoliku. It's hilarious. Michael's senior year. Isn't it? Uh, 110 tackles for Brother Davis, five tackles for loss, one pick, returned 40 yards, by the way, 17 PBUs. He's been a guy that's played over 40 games in the NFL with the Chargers, and the Chargers are a good team. It's not like they're just some slouch and he's out there, right? That wouldn't matter. We would claim it. We love it. Um, Michael Davis has been impressive, and was it Nick Howell that early on said? He's going to be an NFL guy. And I believe Blaine Fowler called his shot as well on that, said if he was at Alabama, he'd be starting. And we were like, wait, what? They were right. Michael Davis has been a tremendous pro player. Diane Gawoluku is the type of player that a special teams coordinator is going to get really excited about. Holds the BYU record since 2000 in fumble recoveries. He has a nose for the ball. Yes, he just makes plays, and he's so physical. He creates turnovers, not just by intercepting them, but by physical contact. He creates fumbles. I love the disruption that he brings on the field. Diane Gawoluku, very, very physical. Michael Davis is more of the speed finesse but a nice combination on the outside defending team's receivers. In deep blue, Dango Wolku talked about how he would play soccer, but he would get too many fouls called on him because he would run into people. And then he discovered football coming over from war-torn Liberia and said, wait, I can hit people? This is my sport, right? (laughs) And so he's been a stat stuffer. Over 200 tackles, over 10 tackles for loss, 15 PBUs, interception and fumble and rush touchdowns. He has five career touchdowns. Pick six, scoop and score, multiple rushing touchdowns. BYU's gone to the scrum package with him and did so this season a bunch um, with Don Gawolko at running back. He's a playmaker. Yeah, it's it's one thing to, like, get an interception or make a nice play. He he takes these interceptions and has a nose for the end zone. Yes, Boise State is freshman year, um, 2018 Cal, scoop and score, uh, multiple scrum packages uh, in the – Bowl game, Western Michigan. Even USC. the interceptions at Mississippi State in the game BYU got hammered Another in. Another pick six. Two interceptions for yes. him. And he just finds a way to get yards, to flip the field when he has the turnover. Yes, just so good. And he's a guy that we put at corner because we like the two safeties yeah. we have here. Yeah. Kainakua and Daniel Sorensen. Yes. How, about, how about those guys? Dirty Dan in Kansas City making plays. Love Daniel Sorensen. Love Kainakua. Both guys that have started multiple games in the NFL. Um, you want to talk about a ball hawk. We talk about Diane's ability to find the ball and create it. turnovers. Kainakua with his three interceptions against Boise State in 2015, including housing the one right mm-hmm. after Tanner Mangum found Mitchell Juergens. He produced the moments the loudest I've heard Lavelle Edwards Stadium in the last decade. The rapture started to happen, and then it stopped. It was like, wait, it's not time. No angels have come down. That's, that's, that's Kainakua, actually. Kainakua sealed the Poinsettia <laughs> Bowl for BYU in 2016 against Wyoming. Josh Allen, who, by the way, is killing it with the Bills. Hello. Former Wyoming quarterback. Yes. He was on a roll. The Cowboys offense got rolling. And you and I were, were talking like, okay, this is the time where Kainakua needs Kainakua to make needs a play. needs to make a play. <laughs> and he did. Yeah. And he did. 164 tackles at BYU for Kai. Eight tackles for loss. 14 picks. It's tied with Dewey Gray for fourth all-time at BYU. Do you know the all-time leader in picks, by the way? I had no idea who this guy was. Dave Atkinson had 20. Uh, Tom Homo, by the way, had 13. I was going to say, Tom should be up there. Tom is uh, sixth. He had a pick six in the 1981 Holiday Bowl against Washington State. Yes, he did. And uh, an interception against Georgia in 82. Okay, what about Dirty Dan Sorensen? 211 tackles, 11 and a half tackles for loss, one sack, eight picks, 23 pass breakups. That's pretty good. Uh, One touchdown. And then he's with the Chiefs now. I mean, Daniel Sorensen, undrafted free agent, has been a regular on a team that has become one of the top five, seven teams the last couple years, right? Uh, in the NFL. Kainakua has been bouncing around in the NFL a little bit, still around on multiple teams uh, with the Browns and the Ravens and the Colts. So best of luck to uh, Kainakua as he continues there. But Dirty Dan has stuck in the NFL, undrafted free agent at that position. So tough um, to do that. He's been, uh, it's been fun to watch him do things. Sealed the win against the Chargers earlier in the season in Mexico City on Monday Night Football. Pretty awesome. He was one yard away from two pick sixes at BYU. Just about had one against Georgia Tech in the <laughs> yeah. coming out party for Ziggy. Yes, 2012. and he had one against Idaho State. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm looking at this defense. As excited as I was about the BYU offense, the BYU defense over the last decade, 
<laughs> Better than the offense, I would argue. Who who hasn't played in the NFL other than Kyrus Tonga and, that's, and Diane Gawoluku? They're BYU, seniors this year, but we think they'll be there. BYU became a defensive school. Like, it's been weird, right? You, you want offense. You see the why, I think, passing. Okay, and last but not least, our all-decade specialists. So at kicker, Trevor Sampson, oh. punter Riley Stevenson, and return specialist J.D. Folsom. Okay, Trevor Sampson, interestingly enough, had the highest percentage of made field goals over an extended period of time in this decade. Single season uh, record of BYU and third all time. Trevor Sampson. 84%. Unscholarshipped at one point. Why? Trevor Sampson is the guy. Mr. Consistency. He earned it, absolutely. Riley Stevenson was a second team All American for BYU. He was a weapon. For the Cougars, Jerem, a wep- a legitimate weapon where Bronco would be like, no, let's punt on purpose because Riley's going to pin them deep. We have an elite defense. Let's put Stevenson out there. 42.9 yards per punt. Every year he had a punt of at least 60 yards. 78 inside the 20. 66, 50 plus. Amazing. Never, never had a punt blocked. That's, a, that's amazing. Second team All-American, Riley Stevenson. And then J.D. Falslev, he had two touchdowns. On returns, Jerem. Not many people remember that. Multiple touchdowns scored as a return specialist. And I did not realize how good he was overall with his average until I looked this up. His 9.6 return average on punts, best since James died. 10 yards a return? 96. 10 yards a return? So quick. Ada Logan, super athletic family. J.D. Falslev was, uh, at first you think sneaky, but Middle Tennessee State, right? What was that, 2014, I want to say? That... So good. He was such a weapon. Um, he was also a very capable holder. Skyview Bobcats, baby. There you go, man. <laughs> so, the de- yeah, defense and specialists. This was a really good group. You look at the talent that BYU put together. I think if in the last decade, obviously, BYU is independent. If they are in the Mountain West, there's multiple 10-win seasons with these guys. Man. But BYU goes Indy. They stack it a little bit. Don't beat Utah. Don't finish in the top 25 without 10-plus wins. It's a little hard, but you can see that the talent's there. People yes. go, ah, it's less talented now. I don't know. Look at that. Well, and specifically, I'm thinking about the 2013 team. If BYU doesn't play seven power fives in 2013, then maybe. They chose that, though. They're a 10-win they team. Chose that. They had seven defensive NFL players on that side of the ball, and Taysom Hill and Jamal Williams. Okay, coming up, you've heard the all-decade teams, but who are the MVPs on offense and defense? Hey, Blaine Fowler gets to flex both literally and mentally with his ideas about members of the all-decade team. This is BYU Sports Nation. Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation, our BYU football all-decade special. Don't forget to listen to the show or any BYU Sports Nation by downloading the podcast. We are pleased to welcome in our favorite uncle, Uncle B, into Studio B, dual threat analyst, national champion quarterback at BYU, Blaine Fowler. Welcome to our all-decade special, Blaine. Oh, Blaine? This is fun stuff to talk about. I and mean, we, we could do a 400-hour show on this. That's called, AO, do, that's called AFR. Oh, okay. That's right. <laughs> no, we, we, we could do the decade. Then we can do the 50-year team. We can do it all. Now, I want to give you props for something that you brought up back in October of 2016 in reference to Michael Davis and you calling your shot about him being an elite talent that could start anywhere for Alabama or LSU or anybody. And people gave you a hard time about this on social media. Our Crack Research Team has tracked down this, this moment in October awesome. of 2016, Blaine. Listen to this. Teams are looking at film and going, wow, this guy is really good. Why are we going to attack this guy when we have young players over there? And it doesn't matter whether Troy's over there or Wilcox is over there or who it is that's over there. They're going to go at that corner. And if you're going at one side, even if they went at Michael Davis all game long, they're going to catch some balls on Michael Davis, just a, just a lower percentage. So they choose higher percentages. So if it seems like... They're picking on those guys. It's because they are, but not because they're going, hey, these guys aren't good and these guys aren't talented. They're going, okay, what's our option here? We go Michael Davis, who can play. Michael Davis could start anywhere in the country. Michael Davis could start at Alabama at corner. He's that good. He, has the, he has the speed. He's got the size. He's a guy that translates into the NFL. And- you called your shot, Blaine. Some people on social media said you were on drugs. We're not going to name names, but they said I got to stop taking drugs. <laughs> you were right, man. And he made our old decade team. Yeah, and, and remember, they had they put Diane in. And, and, and Michael, there were some times when he was struggling when they were getting real complicated with the defense and some of the zone packages that they were running. But I'm going and watching him in one-on-one, and I know what the NFL scouts are looking at, and they're going, man, here's this long dude 
that runs 10 600 meters, runs a high 4.3 or low 4.4 40, um, has great hips, and can just lock people down in man. That's an NFL corner. That's Alabama's corners, right? In fact, I bet I'm not sure where Alabama's corners from 2016 are, but I don't know if they're still starting in the NFL like yeah. Michael is. Yeah. Well, they weren't showing up uh, against Auburn in the Iron Bowl a few weeks ago. So I knew that when he got in a system where all he had to do was football and he could be there eight hours a day and he could learn what he needed to do and he'd play a higher percentage of man, that he'd be a really, really good player. You just look at his physical skill set, and he certainly was that. Hey, he was good when he was here. Give him a guy and say, go lock that guy down. He could lock down anybody in the country. And he's what? still doing it. And he's still doing it for the Los Angeles Chargers of San Diego. They'll always be the San Diego Chargers. I'm calling them the San Diego Chargers. Yeah, they'll always be the San Diego Chargers. And that song needs to come back. That yes, it does. does. So it, good. It's such a good song. Who do you like more, the offense or the defense here? Both awesome, but who, which team uh, well, wins? Well, when, when, when I look at, at what you guys have put together, first of all, I agree with it wholeheartedly. There's a few players that you know, I might add to that. But um, the linebacking core. Whoa. We, we, we could be talking about maybe an all-time linebacking core with a couple of, of exceptions. Kyle Van Noy is good as I mean he was phenomenal and Fred was phenomenal. Um and those two guys are tremendous NFL players. Fred's having a Pro Bowl type of a season. Kyle's been a Super Bowl starter and had huge impact um, on one of the best teams in the history of the game, right? And so these guys are really reproductive really and they weren't they're not just productive now. They were unbelievably productive um, when they were here at BYU. Kyle Van Noy, I, we, we talked about it the other night on our Countdown to Kickoff show, but he just changed the game. He won that game in San Diego in the bowl game. <laughs> I mean, that was crazy yeah. what, what he did. And I've never seen a defensive player just single-handedly take over a game. And so then you take Danny Sorensen and Adam to that linebacking core at strong safety and how good he was here. Dan- Daniel Sorensen may be the best special teams cover guy I've ever seen play at BYU all time, not just in the last 10 years. Um, and that's how he made it in the NFL. Now he's a starter at safety, but he made that team because of his special teams prowess. So, so I really, really like this this defense that you guys have put together, with particular high regard for. Uh, and this isn't taken away from Ziggy and what he's doing now. Um, he was just learning football when he was at BYU. He was like Michael Davis, where he looked at him and went, "Man, this guy's going to be unbelievable." In the in the pros, and if he had played football five years earlier, he would have been the most dominating defender BYU maybe ever had. But he was just learning how to play. Then it was at the end of his senior year that we went, "Whoa, this guy is ridiculous. He's a freak of nature. He's a freak among freaks, and he's been unbelievably productive in the NFL." So, so that defensive side of the ball, you take Ziggy, Danny, and that that group of linebackers, um, man. It, that, that's a good-looking defense you guys have there. What's wild is a lot of these guys played together in 2012 and 13. Yeah, those, incre- those two defenses were unbelievable. And then you look at the offenses, it's young Taysom Hill and Jamal Williams kind of coming along, Cody yeah. Hoffman, pretty incredible. Yeah, and, and when I look over on the offensive side, um, there's some really solid offensive linemen. Um, I feel like BYU's offensive line prowess is coming coming back i think there's multiple nfl guys on the roster right now really is this the next moment where people say you're crazy blaine brady christensen's an nfl guy okay he's an nfl guy um he's just he's going to continue to gain weight his feet are unbelievable he's smart he's physical he's an nfl guy um and and i think he's gonna play a long time in the nfl and there's there's several others that are like freshmen he's a sophomore and i'm saying that right there's several other freshmen sophomore that's that i think are okay look out mark these guys they could be but they've got to have the mentality and they've got to you know, continue to get bigger and stronger. But, but there's, I believe from the group that's in this too deep right now on the offensive line that there's at least three NFL offensive linemen. Woo. And has BYU had three NFL offensive linemen in the last 10 years? No. And so I think that, I think that, that I think they've really done a great job of recruiting offensive linemen right now. Um, you know, Taysom, on that offensive side, has there been a – more explosive player. The problem for Taysom is if Taysom could have stayed healthy his entire time, boy, who knows what he could have done? Because we see him healthy in the NFL, and he's just like one of the more dominating players. He's a freak among freaks. The NFL is a league of freaks, and he's a freak amongst freaks, yes. right? Yeah. And so he was phenomenal when healthy, right? And Jamal, you know, Jamal got hurt and sat out a year and did all that too. Um, yeah, yeah, Jamal, when, when you had Taysom and Jamal – there were times when plays were not run right, when blocking wasn't there, and they still made plays out of them, right? Because they would just one-on-one just beat guys. <laughs> and it happened right there just around the corner. Yep. Like, oh, you didn't block that guy? Don't worry about it. I got him. You know, And, so, so, and you, you can see how talented those two are. Um, 
by what they're doing and producing sure. in the NFL. And, you know, Cody Hoffman, you can't say enough about the all-time leading receiver. So, I, hey, there's great players across across the board on both sides. I think if I have to tilt it one side, I'm going to go on the defensive side just because of that great linebacking core, Danny Sorensen, Ziggy Bronson, who I think is a great – I mean, it, that defense is incredible that you guys Absolutely. put together. Absolutely. Okay, Blaine, you look at the all-decade, all 22 that we have compiled here – did we leave anybody out that deserves consideration? So we, we go back to the offensive line, um, and one of the guys that I think really unheralded, and probably because he just chose not to, I think he could be in the NFL right now, is Austin Hoyt. Okay. Who, who hmm. played four years. Remember, they started the guy as a 6'7", 6'8", 250-pound freshman. And he just kind of grew into the role. And by the time he was a senior, he was a 315-pound monster over there that was really talented and really skilled. Um, and a lot of – when the NFL scouts would come in, and I'd talk to him a lot when I'm at practice, they're always asking about him. And, uh, and he just didn't have an interest in doing it. And that's fine, right? He wanted to move on with his life and be with family and do all that. Didn't want that life. I think – if he wanted to and wanted to work at it and loved, you know, just was loved it and passionate about it, he he has the skill set to play. So Austin, I would say, is one. The other one I was thinking about is um, we forget about him because he was hurt so much. But Craig Bills was a phenomenal talent at safety, and when we had he and Danny on the field at the same time, come on, they were part of that defense. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. Yeah. But he had he had the injuries, and so he was in and out. When healthy, he was an NFL type of a player, and there were. Even though he went and got some tryouts, and then he had some more problems with his foot. And those NFL teams said, get healthy and come back, because we really think that you can play. And he never was able to get as healthy as he, as he wanted to be. But um, when he was healthy, he's as good as anybody we've had back there. And, and I, boy, so we, because he wasn't healthy, we forget about him. But I think Craig Bills is a phenomenal talent at safety as well. We could throw in a long snapper and a holder, too, if you'd like. Yeah, you've to see seen, it. that's the thing. You guys forget that there are more, you've, there's two starters on a team. It's you're an long, hour show, you're, you're Blaine. Long, you're a long snapper, and I, I'm going to put Mitch Harris there because okay. not only does he, and he's the current guy, not only does he do a phenomenal job of snapping it, but he's a great cover guy as well. He's a really athletic long snapper, and he's been money on both and, and, and the short snaps. I put Mitch there. The holder's got to be Gavin. Come on. <laughs> oh, nepotism. <laughs> Wait, Come what on. other holder got credited by the head coach of winning a game? Gavin Bell. Wisconsin. Else, right? Right. And he's the only guy I know period, that can hold for a right-hander, a right-footer, and a left-footer. I, I mean, I can't do it. I never thought about that until we had this conversation. The recently. ambidextrous holder. So, and I can't remember who the lefty was back that, you know, a couple years ago, but but Ed Lamb said to Gavin, well, like, we got to get somebody to hold for the left-footers, and Gavin said, I, I can do both. And Ed's like, no, no, you can't do that. And Gavin's like, yeah, I can do it. And you got to think. Mitch Matthews was telling us that you want to catch the ball with your dominant hand. If you're right-handed, on you're going to catch better with your right hand on yeah. top. Right? And so if you're catching a long – if you're right-handed, you want to hold for a right-footed kicker, your right hand's on top. That directs where you put the ball down, you put your finger on top, and then you rotate the ball with your dominant hand. So now you get to flip over on the other side and try it. I've tried it. I tried to hold for Lee Johnson. Can't do it. I cannot do it. Um, and so it's not an easy thing. So just because Gavin's the ambidextrous holder, and I don't know of any other holder that the head coach said he single-handedly won a big game against a ranked team on the road, we're going to have to give the holder to Gav. I'm okay. sorry. Yeah, let's end on that nepotistic note, <laughs> albeit a good one. And also, there's not many people that can handle anything from Lee Johnson, for the record. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up on our All-Decade Special, we dive into more of the details. This has been fun, hasn't it? So why would you go away? This is BYU Sports Nation. Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, the official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the show wherever you get your podcasts. Shows on demand as well on the BYU TV and BYU Radio apps. Now for the most valuable player of our all-decade BYU football team. Jeremy, I know how much you love to define the term value and MVP, so let's do it. And may I present on the offensive side of the ball, even though he could probably play at a high level on both sides of the ball, Taysom Hill as the offensive MVP. This one feels super obvious, right? He was the best player BYU had in the last decade, I would argue, overall. So dynamic. We outlined it earlier, but such a game changer. Unfortunately, did not play a full career. Uh, Played at least a game in five seasons. But had we seen Taysom Hill full bore, everyone gets hurt, right? But no one gets hurt for season-ending injuries. We would have seen one of the greatest college football players perhaps of the last 10 or 20 years, right? He was that good. I hate that we have to have that conversation. What 
if Taysom Hill had stayed healthy. It's a huge storyline. I him. know. I know. But so many unfortunate and season-ending injuries, and yet he still is the MVP because of what he was actually able to accomplish in spite of those injuries. Yeah, 2013, he has a full season. The year before, he starts two games, which, by the way, people forget, the first play with Taysom Hill as a collegian was an 18-yard touchdown pass, yeah. not run, against Washington State and Mike Leach in 2012. 2014, go, jumps out 4-0. The Utah State game happens. Uh, 2015, plays the one game. 2016, play, plays 12 games. Didn't quite finish that one either. All right, on the defensive side, straight out of Reno, Nevada, Poinsettia Bowl MVP, two-time Super Bowl champion, Kyle Van Noy. Oh, so good. Just I, the fourth quarter, 2012 Poinsettia Bowl, just encapsulates his career. Playmaker, he drove coaches insane, specifically Kelly Papinga. What is he doing? Yelling in the Stay press in box. your assignment! And then he'd make a sack or a tackle for loss or a pass breakup or an interception or a forced fumble or a blocked punt or something, right? Just, just... Van Noyed the opponents, as our graphic says. How many players single-handedly won a game by themselves? Kyle Van Noy, you can make a case, did it against Mississippi in the first game of Independence, and then he did it at the end of 2012. When the defense stunk, what did they do? They said, hey, Kyle, go make a play. Uh, quick story, Kyle Van Noy said to himself on the sideline before that fourth quarter, well, I'm just going to have to go win this game. And he did. And he did. Our thanks to today's guest, Blaine Fowler. Sorry to Dennis Pitt, we ran out of time, and you weren't in this decade either. Conversation continues 24-7 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Use the hashtag BYU. And he just missed it, didn't he? Luckily. <laughs> For Jerem Jordan, I am Spencer Linton. Shout out to K.O.K.L. Aluhi. He's still celebrating in the end zone. Go Cougs!